19. Okay, well, good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to this session to discuss the outlook for Russia. I understand this session was heavily oversubscribed, which is no surprise because Russia finds itself at an absolutely fascinating juncture this morning. Economically, it is facing a crisis following the collapse in the oil price and the impact of sanctions. Geopolitically, it's at a very delicate moment given the confrontation with the West over Crimea and Ukraine. Um, and politically, there are a lot of very important cross currents right now, given that although Putin, President Putin appears to be extremely popular at home, um, there are growing criticisms both internationally and within Russia. So we have a fantastic panel this morning to look at the outlook for Russia at this very, very delicate juncture. I'm not going to have lengthy introductions because I think most of them are probably known to you and there is a lot to discuss. But on my far left, your right, we have Wu Jinbo, who is um, an academic in China who can put the situation into a geopolitical context and in particular look at the crucial question of the degree to which China is or is not willing to help Russia at this very interesting moment. Next to him, we have Alexei Kudrin, who is a man very closely watched at the moment, who was previously finance minister in Russia, is currently an academic, but has been voicing some very interesting views about the current economic situation, and I'm sure that many of you will want to hear what he has to say. Next to him, we have Sir Michael Rake, who is single-handedly representing global business outside Russia. He is the president of the CBI, the um, chief British business group, and he'll be giving us a perspective on how Russia is or is not open for business at the moment. Um, next to him, we have one of the most important bankers in Russia, Andrei Kostin, who is CEO of chairman of VTB Bank, who can talk to us about the impact of the sanctions on the Russian financial sector and the help it is or is not going to receive from the central bank. And on my immediate left, your far right, we have um, Deputy Prime Minister Igor um, Shuvalov, who is going to be explaining to us exactly what the Russian government can or cannot do to get out of the current situation and whether it has any regrets about some of the events over the last year. But um, I'm going to start with um, Kudrin to ask you, you have expressed some very strong views about the severity of the economic crisis um, and the challenges. And so I'm curious, when you look at the economic situation today in Russia, is it worse than, say, in 1998 or 2008? And do you think it's going to be possible to exit the current problems without a full-blown crisis? And um, the speakers will be speaking both in Russian and in English. I think most of you do have um, headphones, so do look at those. And I will say that although this session is closed to the reporting media, it is on the record and it's also being webcast. <coughs> Thank you. A couple of issues uh, which are extremely crucially important for the Russian economy. Uh, probably we have already exhausted uh, the previous model of development uh, when uh, an average uh, growth was about 7% annually. And this uh, growth uh, was uh, based on the growth, uh, growth of demand. Uh, and uh, this driver, we have lost it. Uh, uh, it doesn't work anymore. Even two years ago, uh, with high prices on oil, uh, we didn't uh, get this uh, growth. And the most important problem, uh, low productivity, which uh, doesn't secure, and uh, this productivity is not uh, uh, supported by the uh, um, competitiveness that we need uh, by the corresponding relevant institutions. Uh, and uh, thus, we uh, have to have a totally different structure of economy. We lost uh, uh, some time. and. Uh, we didn't uh, finish uh, building some uh, of the relevant institutions and structural reforms. Uh, and this is also, I'm talking about uh, myself here, because I worked in the government at that time. 
And uh, of course, not uh, I was not alone in taking all these decisions, uh, but um, uh, there was a certain uh, uh, movement. There were shifts uh, in terms of uh, political challenges that we faced at that time, uh, in terms of uh, uh, being uh, uh, good uh, for our uh, constituencies. Uh, um, um, uh, huge expenditures uh, for social support, uh, uh, and uh, we didn't pay uh, sufficient attention to infrastructure. So when we say let's uh, uh, start uh, searching for structural reforms, um, well, we have to uh, say uh, that there is a share of the government as state uh, in the economy. Uh, I mean, a strong regulation on the part of the institutions, but at the same time, uh, the government, the state, uh, shouldn't work uh, in the market as it happens today in the oil and gas sector in industries. Uh, one of the uh, problems uh, is that uh, uh, state corporations uh, um, were not successful in uh, creating an uh, innovation uh, economy. Uh, this is uh, absolutely so. Uh, we are uh, doing something, of, okay, but it's 20 times less uh, than what we had to do uh, in, tu in terms of the competitiveness of Russia. So uh, this model of state corporations uh, uh, failed. Social uh, security, social protection, uh, traditionally uh, Russia and Soviet Union, uh, uh, the, the country uh, was uh, very strong in terms of social protection protection. But now uh, we uh, spend a lot uh, uh, on this uh, item, but uh, it didn't bring us any results. Uh, so uh, we have a gradual uh, reduction in poverty, but it's not adequate in terms of the resources uh, that we invest in this area. And uh, uh, now it is important to uh, uh, have uh, uh, specific spe uh, social support and uh, protection. Uh, uh, and uh, the uh, remaining of the resources uh, we have to use to fight uh, crisis situation uh, uh, to support those who suffer as a result of the crisis, but it should be done uh, more efficiently and uh, in economic way than before. We don't know what the price for oil uh, will be. Um, now they uh, say uh, uh, that uh, uh, probably the drop in prices uh, uh, will lead to the drop in an investment, uh, and then uh, the prices will go up again. I I, 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 I supported this idea before, but it was before uh, uh, what the price will be in two or four years, uh, uh, $40, uh, dollars, uh, 60 80 We don't know. We just don't know. There are quite a few factors involved here. And, um, and thus, um, we just don't know uh, which uh, will be the driver that will uh, uh, identify the key elements of this. The uh, anti-crisis uh, program uh, should not contain uh, uh, the specific uh, elements of supporting uh, uh, citizens or individual enterprises. Uh, uh, the most important problem for the government uh, is trust um, uh, without the uh, structural reforms. Uh, uh, it is uh, 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 without these structural reforms, we won't have uh, trust, uh, and thus we won't be able to get out of this crisis situation, um, come out of it. Second, the steps. Uh, that we uh, have to take, uh, they should be uh, directed against the crisis situation in the area of social support or a distribution of uh, uh, resources within the budget, the so-called uh, budget uh, maneuvering. And um, uh, so uh, it means that um, uh, the gradual uh, in increase in investment uh, into infrastructure will be a structural reform in itself, uh, and uh, etc. And um, another point, um, sanctions are quite uh, 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 felt in Russia. And uh, even under the conditions of sanctions, uh, uh, we can achieve growth. Uh, I uh, spoke about that. Uh, uh, but we have to understand that we have to have a vector of our activities uh, uh, to take steps to uh, settle, to regulate. And then the sanctions uh, sh uh, gradually are going to be reduced. Uh, at least we have to know that they will be not increased. Uh, uh, they will not be tougher, uh, uh, stricter, so that we could uh, fix a certain problem.
problem at certain level and move uh, ahead. If the sanctions are going to be increased, uh, uh, the 50 percent of the measures that we are proposing, they will be just inefficient. And the final uh, point, uh, it is uh, very dangerous today when uh, the government uh, uh, is uh, hugely committed in terms of social support and defense uh, expenditures, uh, measures against a crisis situation, very expensive, uh, to turn uh, back to the um, central bank, uh, uh, the uh, so uh, to get uh, additional reforms, uh, emission uh, resources from the central bank, uh, um, to start to regulate the central bank activities, uh, um, it is a bad way. Uh, probably it will, and most likely, it will uh, reduce the attractiveness of the Russian financial market. Uh, we uh, heard uh, about uh, bad expectations in, in the market. If uh, the central bank is going to credit uh, uh, major corporations, saving them, uh, uh, the financial policy in Russia uh, will become uh, uh, worse, uh, and uh, uh, the investors just won't come. Well, thank you very much indeed, Professor Kudrin, um, for that very coherent set of, one might say, criticisms of the current policies. Um, I'm going to ask the minister to react in a minute, but first, um, you sound as if you have quite a clear idea about what the gr Russian government should do next. Would you like to be in it again? You're from Financial Times, uh, and usually journalists ask me this question, and I always answer, no comments. <laughs> okay, well, that's a pity. Well, that buys the minister more time to think about how he can react to the comments of perhaps maybe in the future of a future colleague, but Minister Chuvalov, um You've heard a number of criticisms that um, Professor Kudrin thinks you should be having privatization. You should not be using the budget to support particular actors within the system. I would imagine the banks would be one of those. And you have also heard that he does not think you should be turning to the central bank to simply support the financial sector. Um, presumably, there is concern about whether the reserves are sufficient and whether that's going to impact the credibility. Um, what is your response? First of all, whatever uh, Alexei Kudrin has just said, I, I totally support. Um, uh, uh, publicly, we always uh, uh, say the same, but uh, in private, we always argue. But here, I uh, uh, support him um, and the uh, dangers. Um, uh, uh, there are certain uh, uh, apprehensions, but this is not reality. And today, when the economy of Russia is in a very difficult situation, a lot of uh, um, talks we hear and uh, gossips. Uh, 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 what we plan to do, or the president of the Russian Federation plans to do, etc. Uh, we start with the central bank. Um, the bank, uh, which uh, acquired its status uh, a year ago, uh, has uh, a unique um, uh, status and unique uh, opportunities and possibilities. Um, and the Russian government, uh, even if uh, um, there is a will and desire to uh, control uh, the uh, authorities of the bank. It is not possible, and uh, it was done. Um, uh, it was done as an institutional achievement, uh, and uh, uh, because of the um, skillful uh, leadership of the previous leadership of uh, the Central Bank of Russia, Mr. Ignatiev, uh, uh, they carried uh, the work uh, uh, and they built uh, uh, the bank uh, as an independent an institution, well, uh, many think uh, uh, independence is a uh, total independence even from the uh, reasonable approach. Uh, no. They always carried independent uh, policies, uh, and the Bank of Russia um, uh, became a single regulator um, on the financial markets, uh, in, including uh, it took independent decisions. We had a certain period of time. Uh, 
so that the government wouldn't encroach on the authorities uh, of the central bank uh, when the ba government uh, couldn't uh, interact with the bank, but it's in the past. We'll learn how to interact uh, with the bank through the board of directors and other instruments uh, uh, to uh, uh, interact and cooperate uh, with the leadership of the bank, uh, but I'll be open. Uh, uh, maybe you know how, the, how it works. Uh, uh, the Bank of Russia is uh, uh, taking its decision independently and uh, often takes uh, this decision uh, against uh, the position of the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Economic De Development. And, and uh, there are no signals uh, that we have to change the situation. Uh, 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 often we uh, have to listen to the Minister of Finances uh, because uh, that's his responsibility um, as a whole. So, both the president and the administration of the president, they understand uh, the responsibility that uh, uh, we have totally, all of us, uh, so that to maintain these achievements with respect to the Central Bank of Russia. And nobody is going to ask questions about the status of the Bank of Russia. Uh, not a single additional measures uh, to influence uh, uh, the bank so that we could uh, squeeze out of them uh, the liquidity so to save some state corporations. Uh, uh, we are not going to do it. It, uh, we don't uh, have plans to do it, uh, and we don't have the possibility to do it. Uh, but uh, uh, we have still here gossips, etc. And uh, well, for instance, uh, recently I heard uh, that uh, we are going to introduce a certain control uh, in terms of currency operations, uh, uh, currency control, in other words. Uh, but uh, we cannot even explain this uh, uh, position. Uh, why should we do it when a dramatic change in exchange rate happened? Uh, people are scared themselves with certain fairy tales uh, themselves. Uh, uh, so um, uh, when uh, all that happened, uh, why would we uh, do it uh, uh, to uh, 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 reintroduce uh, the institution uh, when uh, we had, uh, uh, well, we personally, Kudrin, me, and others, uh, uh, we wanted to uh, kill the uh, currency regulation. And uh, it shouldn't be there, the currency control. Uh, and it is difficult to recreate it. It's very difficult. If we take uh, the law, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it does not nothing uh, because uh, when we have uh, when w uh, we had uh, commercial banks uh, before 2007, whereas commercial agents, we had a very efficient currency control. Then we lost it. Okay. There are many other things. Uh, uh, there are no crazy people in the Russian government. Even, even, if, even if you want to see them, uh, they are not there. And we don't have uh, crazy ideas. Um, uh, we don't discuss them. Um, indeed, we have a parliament. Uh, uh, many think that uh, they, they absolutely, that it is totally subordinate to, to the Kremlin, but I am dealing with the economic policy, and I can say that uh, you cannot order anything uh, to the parliament. Uh, we cannot uh, ask a president uh, or Prime Minister Medvedev, uh, uh, please help us uh, in uh, uh, um, putting through a certain legislation. It is not possible because they have certain, uh, there are certain uh, and sometimes very tough position. Uh, well, for instance, uh, sometimes they uh, are against the position of the government, and sometimes Sometimes uh, even uh, interfere with the policy of the government. Uh, I mean, in terms of everyday uh, politics, politics and activities. Uh, Wolf uh, uh, about the legislation about Mastercard and Visa card. Uh, it is legislation that is very difficult to uh, implement, uh, and the administration of the president and the government uh, uh, advise them not to do it. Uh, uh, the law, which will be difficult to implement, which will be counterproductive. But they didn't listen to, na uh, to us, and they adopted this legislation. Sometimes uh, 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 leaders of the Communist Party or uh, leaders of some uh, political factions, uh, they say that uh, reintroduce uh, currency control through emissions. Uh, we have to uh, uh, carry out investment programs. Uh, they talk a lot, uh, but we have to look at the legislation that exists in Russia. And it's quite modern uh, in Russia. We have problems in terms of the implementation of the existing legislation and so that uh, every would uh, understand that uh, everyone uh, should abide by the law but at the same time uh, when we hear this uh, uh, absolutely extravagant uh, uh, absolutely um, different positions expressed uh, well about the crisis situation uh, um, 
Sometimes you identify parameters of the crisis situation, uh, but uh, Andrei Leonidovich and others and other colleagues and friends in the uh, in this uh, room, we uh, uh, went through the uh, most difficult uh, uh, crisis, 91-93, when we didn't have uh, uh, food on the shelves on the uh, shops, uh, we didn't have money, the enterprises didn't work, uh, we had a natural exchange uh, of goods, uh, a total collapse of the country. Uh, the country just uh, uh, collapsed, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, and a new country appeared, the Russian Federation, and we had to learn uh, to live in these conditions. Then, 98, uh, uh, people uh, don't remember that, they don't uh, uh, talk about this, uh, but probably uh, uh, we remember, some of us, uh, that it was uh, quite a painful uh, situation. Foreign investors suffered, uh, the Russian companies and citizens of Russia, because uh, 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 we went through the uh, collapse of the banking system uh, um many deposits of the people were just lost and uh, very high uh, uh, devaluation. Devol devaluation. And then the crisis 2008-2010. Uh, so when we uh, ask the question of what do you think of this present situation, well, I can say that uh, uh, looks like it's softer than before. But this is uh, just um, um, uh, if we take the uh, depth and the, compl uh, the p com complexity of the situation, I think that uh, we are going into a, a longer uh, crisis situation, uh, more protracted one. Uh, <laughs> of course, uh, uh, well, what would happen if the prices uh, go up? Uh, uh, Alexei Kudrin said that nobody knows what the price will be, but uh, the difficulty of our economy is going to be more difficult because uh, 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 our constituencies uh, want more uh, uh, expenditures if the prices go up uh, for oil. So uh, uh, nothing is good in this uh, uh, current situation. It is a very difficult situation. It's going to be worse, and the anti-crisis uh, plan should uh, a should be aimed at the uh, the ad adaptation to the hard landing, as we said before. Um, um, and um, uh, we have to learn how to live uh, from citizens of Russia to corporates uh, uh, in these difficult situations. And uh, we have to carry our reforms now, uh, reforms that we've been uh, talking about a long time. Um, and uh, my uh, uh, apprehension is that uh, this agenda uh, can uh, disappear quickly uh, if we get uh, uh, back expert uh, um, income. Uh, so this agenda will be changed, and that's uh, uh, what I'm afraid of. Thank you very much indeed for that very interesting um, um, presentation. I mean, just a quick question before I turn to a view from the banking sector. When you look at the current situation, and given that you've said you think, you think it could get worse, do you think that the cost of what has happened in the Ukraine and Crimea is too high in terms of the economic cost? Do you regret that? You know that uh, uh, many believe, uh, and many uh, want to say this, uh, that whatever is happening now is because of the uh, crisis in the Ukraine. I would say more. Um, if uh, we didn't have the crisis in Ukraine and uh, we would have uh, the price uh, for oil of 47 and probably below that and we wouldn't have this uh, factor, sanctions, Ukraine, etc., uh, the situation would be much worse, uh, tougher, because uh, after crime of Crimea and uh, Ukraine and sanctions, because people don't link sanctions uh, to uh, Putin because uh, uh, people People believe that this is attack uh, Russia. Why he has these huge ratings? Uh, because uh, people uh, see uh, that the, uh, uh, it's attack against Russia. So we have to unite around our uh, leader. We have the mentality, certain mentality. Uh, you have to know the Russian history. And uh, in these uh, uh, conditions of this high consol consolidation and uh, with uh, all the conditions, tough conditions outside and inside, we have to implement this uh, agenda. If we didn't have uh, this consolidation and the prices would be high, it would be uh, twice 
is difficult to implement this agenda. So if we just put aside politics and just uh, concentrate on political uh, objectives, uh, this uh, uh, consolidation and tough conditions, it's a huge starting point, point for reforms. And, but uh, uh, to carry out reforms in bad conditions outside and inside and uh, with uh, low support from the population, it is hardly uh, possible. Uh, nobody would be, uh, not would, nobody would dare to uh, carry it on. Uh, so it's not that I regret, uh, I don't regret. Uh, I'm just saying that uh, uh, it uh, gives us a good uh, handicap. So just before I turn to Mr. Corsten, um you're basically arguing that there is no chance of a change in the strategy towards Ukraine because of the economic crisis. Have I understood you correctly? No, no, no. <laughs> well, I'd be, I'd be curious to hear your views as well. You can choose. <laughs> no, I, I think I mean, you ask him, not. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't I ask both of you? That's the interest of democracy. You can both yeah. get a chance to voice your opinions. I mean, I don't understand why you ask, ask to change. I think there's a, there's a process of mutual mutually finding the right solution to the crisis. And uh, the more you press on Russia, uh, I don't think the situation in Ukraine will improve. What we expect uh, that we would like you to, or the West, to listen to Russia and jointly to find the common solution. I think what we discuss now, we discuss the German, uh, Germany, France, Ukraine, Russia, I think that's, that's the format we should discuss. Asking Russia to change the policy is not the correct way. Russia is very eager to find a solution. I can tell you from my personal meeting with Mr. Putin and Mr. Shovalov, I'm sure would, would support me in this. Mr. Putin is probably more than anybody else is keen to resolve the issue. Russia is not benefiting from the situation. Russia doesn't want to benefit from the situation. Russia uh, support, I mean, Russia is very concerned about the both economic and political situation in Ukraine. We are not benefiting, we are not benefiting from sanctions which are imposed by the West on Russia. We are losing from this situation. So I'm quite sure that we are very much interested in resolving this issue. But right. just pressing on Russia, on Russia, just imposing more sanctions will not resolve this issue. Russia, you can't speak to any nation uh, with sanctions. Uh, no, no, no nations, I think, uh, will bend to sanctions. Uh, no Germany, no France, no Russia. And uh, I think that's a completely uh, wrong approach. Um, and uh, I think the business community, I have to uh, openly say that I'm meeting a lot of people here, no businessmen. I met at least, no banker I met, saying that sanction is the correct way. Right, well, thank you for that very clear view. I don't know whether... Deputy Prime Minister wishes to add anything about but that. Can if not, I we'll turn add to to something? Because otherwise, you know, I wouldn't be able to comment after everybody. <laughs> okay. Um, well, perhaps I can then ask about the financial situation and the banking situation, because the Deputy Prime Minister has said that the Russian Central Bank is independent. Um, and yet, at the moment, you do have the Russian banking system with a large amount of foreign debt. I think you have 4.3 billion of foreign debt coming due this year at your own bank. Are you assuming that the central bank will continue to help you? And just how bad is the situation in the banking sector? Because we've already seen Trust Bank, for example, um, have a serious problem. Um, how much help do you think you need? The situation probably not bad, but it's different. And uh, I would say it's not it's not the way which uh, I would like uh, my bank to develop because uh, starting from 2007, uh, when VTB was 100% uh, government owned, we set a program with the, with the agreement of the government, of course, who uh, was and still our main shareholder. We set a target to privatize our bank, to fully integrate the bank into international uh, banking system. And that's how we started our privatization uh, programs in that time. Uh, we had a number of uh, privatizations, and uh, we successfully sold, uh, I think, up to 14 billion uh, uh, value stocks to the international market. But uh, today, mainly because of the uh, 
uh, for a number of reasons. One is, of course, the sanctions, which are not uh, allowing foreign investors to buy our new stocks. <coughs> and secondly, because of the worsening uh, economic environment, we, uh, we are not in a position to uh, further privatize our banks. Mr. Kudin mentioned that one of the problems for the Russian economy is uh, uh, too much government um, uh, in the economy. But uh, we are now restricted by, for example, sanctions by further privatization. So, 60% um, of our stocks belong to the government, and uh, we now uh, have no um, possibility to, to uh, approach the international market for uh, the debt market. So the only, uh, the final uh, resource for us is the central bank. Uh, so we are borrowing from central bank, and we get uh, a large support from the Russian government uh, for um, uh, our capital. Uh, but um, our external debt to foreign debtor, uh, debtors at the moment is uh, around $30 billion. Uh, it's equally spread for the next 10 years. This year, as you correctly pointed out, we have to repay about $4.3 billion, which represent only 2.5% of our liabilities, which is absolutely no problem for our bank. Uh, and we, we don't need any support. Uh, of the central bank or the government from this point of view, I, I'm quite sure that overall uh, neither Russian government nor Russian corporate sector uh, would have any problem of repaying the debt either this year or next year. Uh, um, uh, beside the Russian central bank already announced the program of assistance to the other corporations who would need the hard currency um, funds uh, to repay debt. So I'm quite sure that um, foreign uh, creditors and uh, foreign investors would be quite um, um, comfortable from this point of view that, that they will get uh, their money back. Well, I'm sure that's going to reassure people in the room, or I hope it does. Um, but on another question, I mean, everyone's assuming that the sanctions will stay the same or maybe be lifted over the next year or two. If the sanctions, in fact, increased and, for example, there was an attempt to exclude Russia from SWIFT, how damaging would that be for a bank like VTB? And can you find an alternative, say, by building a system with China? You know, we already uh, created the domestic system which might replace SWIFT. Uh, we'll definitely, in discussions with our um, uh, Chinese partners, in order to create the system of settlement in, in local currencies. But I would like to uh, stress one thing. If things like this happens, it will lead to an immense worsening of a general relationship between East and West. I once mentioned openly to American ambassador in Russia, new ambassador, that I think if it happens the next day, both ambassadors in Washington and Moscow can leave the capitals. Because it happened before, for example, in the relationship between Iran uh, and America. But then it was a completely different kind of relationship. There was no political dialogue, there was no cultural or any other relationship between Iran and America. It means that Russia and America might have no relationship after that. If there is no SWIFT, if there is no banking corresponding relationship, it means that the countries on the verge of war, or they're definitely in a cold war, so we should better prevent this kind of relationship between East and West. I think it's not that it will be a matter of VTB bank, it will <laughs> not be just a matter of banking sector, it will be a very dangerous situation. I don't think anybody in this audience will be interested in this kind of relationship. Well, as someone who wrote about the financial system for years, never before has such a geeky, obscure corner of the financial world managed to potentially be the source of a war. So that's fascinating. But um, on that note, I'd like to ask Wu um on the issue of China's relationship with Russia, I mean, many of my Russian friends have indicated they hope to get support from China and hope that, in fact, that if there is a worsening of sanctions, China will step in. And so what's happened with SWIFT, of course, is very symbolic in that respect. Do you think that Chinese government is willing to provide significant support to Russia um, over issues like SWIFT if the situation gets worse? Well, um, China and Russia are certainly um, good friends, uh, not only in uh, 
between two countries and also between uh, two leaders, between Chinese uh, President Xi and uh, uh, President Putin. So uh, in China, we uh, believe that France, uh, you need a France indeed. So now Russia is in a difficult situation, and if they uh, need and ask for some assistance from China, I think China would be uh, willing to uh, do something it can uh, to help our, uh, 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 our uh, neighbor and friend uh, to uh, take over the crisis. Um, there are several things uh, um, uh, that China can do when it comes to the uh, financial issue. Uh, you just mentioned the alternative to the SWIFT system. Um, I recall that last uh, September, the um, uh, Chinese Vice Premier Deng and uh, Deputy uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, Shulakov, um, they reached an agreement about, you know, our two countries may uh, uh, develop some um, interbank uh, payment uh, system. So uh, actually, this idea um, from the Chinese side uh, 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 to create a different uh, cross-border uh, interbank payment system came up earlier when, uh, 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 according to the uh, Snowden revelation, uh, that the USS has been monitoring the um, um, transactions uh, uh, down through uh, visa, visa and also uh, SWIFT. So that reminds us uh, that we need to create an alternative to the current uh, SWIFT system. Um, other things uh, we can uh, uh, cooperate with uh, Russia is that uh, our two countries have the uh, bilateral uh, currency swamp arrangement up to uh, something like 200, uh, 25 billion US dollars. And also uh, last year among the, uh, the BRICS countries, China, Russia, uh, India, Brazil, and South Africa, uh, we are working on uh, um, uh, some emergency arrangements up to 100 billion US dollars among the five members of the, uh, of the uh, BRICS. So, um, and then uh, last year we uh, signed two major uh, deals with uh, Russia on the uh, uh, um, uh, net gas, uh, which uh, will, in the next 30 years, will be uh, up to uh, over 400 billion US dollars. Uh, although this, you know, uh, uh, will not happen until after 2017, 2018, but uh, the construction work for the pipeline, for the infrastructure, uh, uh, on the way. So, um, and also, uh, I think uh, uh, Russia is now encouraging China to invest more, I mean, direct investment in Russia's uh, energy sector. So, in many ways, uh, we can uh, help our Russian friends to turn over the current difficulty. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure they're delighted to hear that. Um, Deputy Prime Minister. Yes, um, I wanted to comment on China and on our eastern vector uh, as a whole. Another urban myth, I don't know who the author of that myth is, it's not important when sanctions were introduced, it was said that due to the fact that the West is reducing its cooperation with Russia, Russia is now forced to cooperate with China. And whatever Russia was obtaining from the West, Russia will try to obtain from the East and primarily from China because it's a huge market and a country with huge reserves. But this is a myth. It is not the truth. Well before these events, Mr. Putin asked me to work with the Ministry of uh, Economic Development on its eastern vector. I was, I was asked to do that in 2010 when we were developing our uh, Vladivostok summit uh, uh, agenda. We started to develop that agenda for the Vladivostok summit in 2010. We had no problems with the West and no frictions with the West at that time. So when we produced the report to Mr. Putin, the report was based on a balanced, simple uh, um, roadmap. Our main partner is the EU. 50% of our export potential goes to the West and to the EU. We're a nation country, not just a European country. We have a vast border with China. Korea is another neighbor. Japan is also very close. Our trade relations with the eastern vector is not very well developed. The political dialogue, however, was developing very vigorously with um, Japan, uh, with China, and, uh, and um, 
South Korea. North Korea, well, everybody has a difficult relationship with North Korea, but we had some trade in the Far East with uh, North Korea. We had our own ambitions, our own competences there in the East, and at that time we understood that the EU is not the only one who says that it shouldn't be that dependent on Russian energy sources. Russia also needs to have a well-balanced structure of its export and the possibility to trade equally, uh, to have a parity of trade on its eastern and uh, western flank. And what did we see? We saw that at the very highest uh, political level, we have very good relationship with political leaders of China, but trade is lagging behind, uh, trans-border train, pre-border trade is, is uh, developing, but uh, trade between trade between Russia and China was not developing as it should have been, whereas the U.S. did that very vigorously. We all had to study Henry Kissinger's book. Uh, very thoroughly because he gives a, an example of sanctions and what to do with sanctions. Anyway, um, when we decided that we had to develop our relationship with the East and President Putin talked about it in September 2012, uh, it was not emotional. It had no uh, wicked intention behind it. This was a very pragmatic agenda. In order to be a strong economic uh, system, we should learn to trade with the East as well as we're trading with the West, not just in terms of volumes, but with a totally different range of products. But when sanctions were introduced, many said, well, we won't trade with you. We will force you to behave in a particular way. But you must know Mr. Putin's uh, personality. Sanctions will never, ever force him to do anything differently. Russians are like that. And it's a sh and, uh, that's it. But the West only knows this way of acting, so it's acting as it can. But we must think about our own uh, people. So we immediately, immediately started our dialogue uh, with China on all possible channels. I've never worked with China, but I was asked to look at in investment into our energy sector, and we've achieved quite a lot there. But there was a vast amount of stuff where we, we never really thought of each other. We never really int were interested in trading with each other. So Alibaba, JTCom, and all these companies, all these possibilities of private Chinese business were never even tested or tapped by us. So we have to investigate this agenda very quickly and develop it very quickly. Of course, I would lie if I would tell you it's very easy to go to China or to uh, receive uh, Chinese guests at home and to agree something. It's difficult to negotiate with them. It takes time, but we have goodwill. We have the interest at the government level. We have vigor and large Chinese corporations are coming to our private investors, are coming to us in the government and asking for political support and say, we'll do everything ourselves. We've never seen these investors before, but now these young chaps who are multi-billionaires are coming to Moscow. And I've learned that young billionaires exist not just in Moscow, but also in China. But you must understand that we have no illusions vis-a-vis -vis China. It's not that we are hoping that whatever we're losing, as it were, in the West, we will immediately regain in the East. But the West should not think that we will never gain anything in the East. We will. We're an interesting partner for the East, and we will develop this agenda. So on the one hand, we understand that they're a difficult partner. On the other hand, this partner has a huge potential and opportunity Opportunity. And of course, we are moving forward. We've created many institutions and platforms that are developing this agenda very vigorously now. Right. Well, that's fascinating. Well, I'm going to ask in a minute um, for Michael to talk about how the new excitement about embracing China makes British business or European business feel. But um, first, I'd just like to ask Deputy Prime Minister, I mean, one way that China could potentially practically help Russia pretty soon would be through the issue of foreign currency reserves. You have already used up one-fifth of your foreign currency reserves. And one issue which is obviously weighing on the ruble is the question of whether those reserves can be maintained indefinitely or not. Would you like to ask your newfound Chinese friends for help with supporting the ruble? I would say the following, that the Central Bank of the Russian Federation has its own competency uh, and it is independent. Uh, and I know that uh, uh, the Bank of Russia and Ms. Nabiulina, they work hard on this particular agenda. I mean, uh, about the authorities and competence of the bank. I don't have the right, I know in greater detail what is going on, but I uh, don't, don't have the right uh, to tell you about this. As about uh, the expansion of the trading uh, 
uh, group, uh, Yuan Ruble, and etc. We expect uh, that uh, uh, the Minister of Finance of Russia will come to uh, China uh, in uh, pretty soon, uh, and uh, and the Minister of Finance of China is uh, quite friendly towards Russia. So uh, we uh, have several uh, draft projects, uh, uh, currency reserves, uh, the possibility of settlement, uh, uh, the use of uh, resources to support export operations. Uh, once again, uh, it would be not true if I say that it works, uh, everything works, uh, but within one year we can uh, build the foundation when the foundation would be a real support. And does, does President Putin have any plans to go to China soon? You know, President Putin and Mr. Sensitin, uh, they uh, meet uh, uh, annually several times, G20 different uh, visits. Uh, recently, we had a big uh, a visit of Mr. Putin to Shanghai, to China, and uh, uh, they met uh, the two leaders. And, uh, and um, after um, long protracted negotiations, uh, they signed uh, the gas contract and uh, many other contracts and agreements, 40 of them, but they uh, meet on a regular basis several times a year. Um, and of course, uh, it will uh, be the same in the future, uh, but you uh, should uh, remember that uh, the first uh, foreign visit, uh, uh, which was uh, uh, conducted by the Chinese leader, was the visit to the Russian Federation. It was a state visit, uh, and the agenda was uh, quite uh, tense and exhaustive, and uh, they, he proposed uh, several formats, uh, uh, but unfortunately, the Russian probably uh, couldn't read the si signals, uh, and now we're coming back in the Chinese way, and etc. So that's why we are going to develop further with China. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn to question in a few minutes. I'd like to ask Sir Michael, um, when you hear about Russia's growing interest in building links with Chinese businessmen, um, do you think that that means that the door is effectively shut to European business now? I mean, do any of the members of the British um, CBI have any interest in trying to start new investments in Russia today? Yeah. Let, let me, I'll come to that, but just a few brief general points. I mean, firstly, obviously, as we all know, business prefers predictability and stability. However, all global companies have had to learn to deal with the opposite in, in the last decade or so. Most recently, I think, as we begin to see a recovery that was so important economically and politically, we've been rocked by a few things that no one expected. Perhaps we could have predicted the Middle East, but from left field came Ukraine, completely unforeseen was the fall in the price of oil, uh, the Swiss currency movement, and the volatility in the ruble. So this creates uh, an enormous uh, environment of instability that we have to manage through and look at. I think insofar as Russia is concerned, you know, we have to understand from a business perspective, we have no choice but to uh, respect sanctions to the letter because the penalties are draconian, and you could be put out of business uh, for not respecting those sanctions. Uh, having said that, I think business is concerned that these sanctions are damaging to both sides, uh, particularly countries like Germany, Italy, France, and London in financial services, uh, and we don't think that's healthy. What we would like to see, obviously, is engagement at a private level, particularly between the leaders of these countries, Europe, uh, United States, and Russia to respect each other's history, strategic interests, and to come to some conclusions as to the misunderstandings that clearly did seem to have occurred in relation to Ukraine, and to put this right, because that's what we believe would be best for everyone and for the creation of jobs, because we see enormous opportunities for business with Russia. It's one of the largest, the largest country in the world with huge resources. I mean, specifically on Russia, if we look at the history from the post-Soviet time, there was a bit of a bonanza huge amounts of investment, uh, some degree of concern about consistency of application of the legal system, the fiscal system, and I think we were beginning to see progress there. But I think, you know, these latest events are, are unfortunate uh, in, in, those, in that respect. And I think what we're seeing with business actually, uh, whilst respecting sanctions, it's difficult to see because of instability much investment, but I think a lot of companies want to maintain their position in Russia and hope that we see to a, an easing of tensions. I think also, actually, one must remember for Russia that they've been much wiser, for example, than the United Kingdom about conservatism over their reserves, some of their assets in terms of the reserves they have. Uh, so they do have an opportunity to reform, to move the economy forward on a, on a knowledge basis. So I think there's some really interesting opportunities for Russia here. 
uh, you know, to, to make those changes that the first Deputy Prime Minister also has, has referred to. And I think business should see that as an opportunity. Equally, I don't think at all we should see Russia doing business with China as a threat. The UK likes very much to do business with China. I think uh, most business leaders' biggest concern would be the, what, what uh, my, my colleague here talked about was that this translates into a, a severance of the relationship between Russia and the West that's much more dangerous uh, rather than any issue of trade. Uh, I think the issues of mutuality of access to energy are really important for everybody. There's a mutual interest in this. And business hopes uh, that common sense will prevail and our political leaders can get together and create an environment in which business can invest and create jobs. Well, I'm sure many people in the room would, would echo that. Um, I'm going to ask the audience now for questions, but before I do quickly, um, Professor Guzlin, do you have any, anything else to add in, well, now that you've heard the rest of the panel commenting? If not, we'll turn to questions. But I would like to add, uh, um, maybe I'm uh, more independent uh, now than uh, when I was in the government. Uh, uh, the role of the sanctions is really, really uh, high. Uh, we should not underestimate it. I am against sanctions. Uh, I also do believe that uh, they destroy the international infrastructure, not only Russian, but international, global as well. Because we see local conflicts. There are local conflicts. And, and if uh, you select uh, uh, an instrument, uh, um, I mean, sanctions, uh, we get uh, a totally different uh, form of globalization, more expensive one, when uh, uh, there is an attempt uh, uh, to impose uh, uh, your own rules, uh, uh, and it is done through the mechanisms or instruments uh, which undermine agreements, conventions. Uh, um, uh, and, uh, of course, uh, it, uh, uh, it is uh, an instability factor, not only in relations with Russia, uh, but unfortunately it has an impact on the rest of the world. But uh, unfortunately, R Russia, uh, of course, feels uh, the serious pressure on the part of sanctions uh, and the fall of the ruble, the plummeting of the ruble. Of course, it is connect connected with sanctions. Uh, uh, we don't get uh, uh, foreign uh, uh, financing, uh, not sufficient. Uh, but we are going to pay uh, the credits, $120 billion. Uh, uh, part of it, it will be re refinanced, apparently. Uh, but again, uh, this is a lot of pressure on the exchange rate, uh, and uh, uh, about $90, $100 billion will leave uh, the country. And this is a huge blow to the uh, Russian economy. Uh, so we um, shouldn't underestimate that. Uh, we should uh, clearly understand the price that we pay and search for the ways uh, uh, how to uh, reduce uh, uh, this price. Um, that's uh, what I wanted to add, uh, basically. Um, do, you, do you think that President Putin understands the price? Um, of course. Um, he, uh, uh, on a continuous basis, uh, takes advice uh, from uh, the experts, consults with them. Uh, um, it is very difficult for me to say something uh, uh, because I am not uh, in the government, with the government. Uh, it is difficult for me to evaluate the strategy and tactics uh, uh, on the part of the president. But um, as everyone else, I would like, I, I, I'm trying to understand it. Uh, well, I see uh, the objectives uh, relating to the position of the Russian Federation. Uh, uh, in the international world uh, as a stronger state, uh, they uh, probably um, uh, have uh, more value than the price that we are going to uh, uh, pay. But we don't know uh, what price we are going to pay anyway, not now. That's my uh, uh, point of view. Right. Well, that seems like a good moment to turn to questions from the audience. I know many of you have got questions. I would ask you to make any questions very short, and if you wish to direct them to someone in particular, please indicate who you'd like to direct them to. Please do not make lengthy statements, because there are clearly a lot of highly emotional issues at work now, and it would be easier just to get some short questions or very, very brief comments. And lastly, it's not compulsory to identify yourself, but it would be courteous. Any questions? Right, one in the front. I think we have some microphones. У нас есть микрофоны, так что вам сейчас поднесут Майкл Яна, 
политика Дании, видимо, журналист. Можем ли мы дойти до такой точки, что кризис поставит под угрозу власти и положение Путина? I'll start answering. Алексей uh, said I have fewer opportunities because I'm a member of the government, but I can speak quite frankly and sincerely without beating around the bush, notwithstanding the fact that I work in the government and without... Uh, and, and of course, even if I'm not inside the government, and when I vote with, and I go vote to the polling station with my family, we discuss very vigorously who to support inside our family. But when, of course, I support uh, President Putin as a voter, as a citizen, not as a member of government. But given all of this, I'll make one remark with regard to what uh, Mr. Kudrin said. I think that also that the sanctions are destructive, and I don't like them. If in my words I gave you a signal to the contrary, that's wrong. But we just work differently with each other. The atmosphere exists, and we must get the maximum out of it. We must get maximum benefit for our people out of the situation that exists. Of course, it would have been better if we had no sanctions at all, if we didn't have such a standoff with the Western world. It would have been wonderful if we didn't have high inflation, etc. But since we have this, given the fact that we have this, we should not relax, we should tone ourselves up and get the maximum positive effect from this situation. And as to your question, I'm being asked this all the time in Moscow and abroad. But I think that when people ask me this question, they just don't understand the makeup of a Russian person. I don't mean ethnic Russian. A, a person who was born and who has grown up and lives in Russia, sort of a Russian makeup person. You don't know Russian history. These people don't understand how it works. They don't understand our mentality. We are a complicated federation where we have um, national ethnic republics. Mr. Minyakhanov here represents one of the best uh, regions. He is the president of Tatarstan. This is a Muslim republic because the majority and the kind of eponymous nation are Tatars who are Muslims. The more 22 million Muslims live in our country. We have uh, Finno-Ugorian people, Slavic people, whatever. We're a complicated mix. Once I had a, an opportunity to sit at a table with uh, Mrs. Merkel and to discuss Russia with her. It was the 60th of the Eastern Com Committee for the uh, German economy. And in Russian, she suddenly asked me, uh, Mr. Putin, does he think about freedom? Because she said that she is thinking of about the freedom of the German people daily. And I said, of course, Mr. Putin is thinking about freedom. But imagine that you are sitting in the Kremlin and you need to say something that will unite people who live in Kaliningrad and in Petropavlovsk, Kamchatsk, in the Far East. They look the same, they speak the same language with perhaps a few uh, accent differences, but we have no dialects like in other countries. And the president sitting in one place has to unite all these people. Only some go to do shopping in Poland and Lithuania, others go shopping to Korea. And somehow there should be a, 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 a unification platform for all of these. And of course, in this context, President Putin should ponder freedom. And he does ponder it. And I remember there was a, a, a very interesting representative of the German nation who was a Russian empress for 34 years running, running. And if you know your history, her first measure that she wanted to introduced was to free the Russian peasants, but she was explained, they explained, uh, they, she was told very quickly, she was told very quickly that should she meddle with these things, uh, she'll be dealt with how she dealt with her husband. I murdered and she wrote letters to Voltaire, and Voltaire thought that she was very liberal and enlightened, but there was no freedom in Russia because that freedom as understood by Voltaire would have been brought grief to the country. So when you give some freedom to somebody, you should not bring them d misfortune and grief. The last reform that brought freedom and grief and misfortune was Gorbachev's reforms. It seemed that they will bring freedom and immediate, immediate uh, well-being. In fact, this freedom and liberty brought poverty, collapse, and disaster. So when we talk about this, we must remember the nature of the Russian people and we must remember our history. I would like people, if they're, if, if they're keen to understand us, to read a little bit of our history and how we developed the last 250 years. Have a look at what existed in Russia at the eve of the First World War, what happened and why did the revolution take place, what happened in the Stalinist times. 
those who uh, are lawyers, are trained as lawyers, we just had to learn our history and had to look at the history of state and law. So if a Russian, if a Russian feels any pressure from outside, the Russian will never, never turn away and give up his or her leader. So any decisions taken in the country to consume less, to consume less electricity, to consume fewer commodities, to tighten the belt, fine. But if, if we feel that somebody from the outside wants to change our leader, and to influence our will, we shall be united as never before. Of course, there is another side of the medal. As soon as we stop feeling this outside pressure, things start changing from the inside gradually. I know that the West cannot move away from these sanctions very quickly, and that's the problem. The longer the sanctions last, the worse for the economy. But politically, politically, Putin will enjoy greater and greater support. And coming back, uh, to this, the government should nevertheless have a lot of courage and a lot of wisdom to undertake serious, much-needed reforms based on phenomenal support enjoyed by the president. Putin enjoys massive support, widespread report, and he should use it, and the government should use it to introduce reforms. One comment with regard to the fact that Gorbachev wanted to bring us freedom and brought us collapse, destruction, and uh, poverty. I absolutely disagree. As a matter of principle, I disagree because the reason for difficult reforms and complicated reforms uh, after the Soviet Union uh, were that the political Soviet elite, elite from the end of the 60s to the 70s, etc., was totally inadequate, was totally incompetent. The problems were mounting, the problem were shoved under the carpet, the industrial output was reducing, economy was inefficient, there was no competition. All of that corrosion of Russian of the Soviet economy uh, brought down by uh, high oil prices collapsed when oil prices collapsed at the same time as Gorbachev came to power. So when one says that Gorbachev brought freedom and brought destruction to the country, that is totally wrong. Okay, I have to reply. This polemic is very interesting. I said what I said, and I'm responsible for my own words. And remember Mr. Yakovlev's last interview before he died. Mr. Yakovlev was the political idea of Gorbachev's reform. He said this was their mistake. They thought that bringing human freedoms, human rights and freedom to people, they will motivate people to work better and to become, and to, to, to build their own well-being. I did not invent this. A person very close to Gorbachev said that. What I'm saying is that freedom and liberty should go hand in hand with a particular certain degree of cultural, motivational, economic development. Freedom, which are, uh, people are trying to impose on us, this absolute freedom, freedom from common sense, freedom of media to insult anyone, to insult an elected politician, to throw dirt in his face. Is that freedom? No, that's not freedom. If you have this kind of, to have this kind of legislation, to have this kind of um, liberty, you have to have, people have to have their own internal limitations and checks and balances, but that takes centuries. Do you think we don't want Western type democracy? Of course we'd love it, but it can't happen overnight. It can happen through decades of hard Hard work. Okay, I'll make a very short uh, comment then. I agree with Mr. Shuvalov that yes, internal culture should exist, but institutions should also exist and they should be created. And when we say that today we're not ready for freedom and liberty, or when we say we don't have enough culture and internal motivation, that's not quite right. This way we justify the fact that our courts are managed from a center, that our courts are not independent. I didn't say that I agree that we need institutions. I didn't say that lack of culture is a motivation for limiting freedom. Well, what I heard you say is that for a while we could turn away from freedom for the sake of other things. Do comment. No, we can go, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you and me and the rest. Well, this is democracy in action. <laughs> but it was interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, any more questions? Uh, yes, my name is Evgenia Erwitz. I'm editor in 
editor-in-chief of the Moscow-based independent political magazine, The New Times. Uh, I have to say that, Mr. Shuvalov, your interpretation of Russian history is quite peculiar. I would uh, remind you that at the same time that Catherine the Great was the, uh, the czarist of Russia, she created the Pale of Settlement, where all Jews were put, uh, this great ghetto for Jews. So there were, you know, she was a very peculiar uh, uh, representative of the Russian czarist family, and I wouldn't say it was very smart, I'm sorry to say this, to address, uh, to uh, address uh, to the history of Catherine the Great. There was Peter the Great, there were a couple of other Tsars who did something, or you know, uh, Tsar Alexander II, who okay. conducted reforms of the Russian judiciary and gave freedom to Russian uh, slaves. But my question is the following. Okay, brief, because uh, we have a lot of questions to go through. Yeah, I had to say this because I'm a citizen of the Russian Federation. Okay, but brief. Uh, my question is the following. If not for the freedoms that were given to you, given to you personally, Mr. Shualov, by Gorbachev and Yakovlev and the whole, the whole process of perestroika that gave freedom to millions of Russians to take care about their lives, to take care about their lives and to help others, as Amartya Sen once said. If not for that, did you have a chance to become a very wealthy person? Did you have a chance to become the uh, first deputy prime minister of the Russian Federation? Did you have the chance for anything, Mr. Shuvalov, да, if not for perestroika that happened when you were a kid? Да. Значит, я отвечу. Thank you. Значит, uh, briefly, no, then we'll look to the да, future. Евгений, не надо с таким как бы рвением. Right. Okay. Well, I'm speaking uh, calmly, so perhaps you can put these questions to me calmly. There's too much temperament in your question. But going back to Catherine the Great, I spent two years studying her reign. This was my job at the university, or I had to do it. So I don't judge her as a person. I judge her as a stateswoman, and I talk about her reforms. I'm just, I just said that she really, really wanted to give freedoms to the Russian people. The president of Tatarstan was here, but he left. They love Catherine the Great there. They all remember Ivan the Fourth, who was a buddy who conquered Tatarstan, and they love Catherine the Great because she allowed them to build tall minarets. Well, she was ardent to bring more freedom to the Russian people and wanted to do it, but she could not do it. She could not undertake her agenda because she realized that she had a higher level of responsibility. Perhaps I am not entitled to interpret Putin's policies. I'm not involved in political processes. But I think that he is very much very keen to give the Russian people freedom and well-being, but without destroying the basis of the country and without killing many, many people. As far as me personally, if not for perestroika, I would not be well educated. I wouldn't have been sent to study at a American university. Perhaps my career wouldn't have uh, been so wonderful and I wouldn't have been so rich. Of course, perhaps not, but the price, the price was high, and I realized what the price was only in 2011. I read a book that a friend of mine gave me, perhaps Mr. Uh, Gref, or maybe it was Krasinski. It's a book um, about a politician who built up a nation, and we look at the authority of this politician, and he has a huge authority in the world. And he is, uh, many questions are put to him about democracy, amongst other things. OK, I'll be short, I'll be short. So he said, not a single serious politician has the right to, to rule the country if he hasn't been uh, elected. I was sent uh, to, uh, to elections far away from Moscow. A former governor from Primorye is here, Mr. Dad. Can you understand that the species and people have a different agenda? They want to be free from poverty, for instance. They can't forgive 
the humiliation where their daughters were forced to become prostitutes, when their sons were forced to become bandits. And they can't forgive us, they can't forgive Gorbachev, because their generation had to live through this. I won. I received advantages, and you did. But millions, millions didn't. I'm just saying that what happened was happened in a very cruel way. Could it have happened differently? Maybe uh, maybe Gorbachev couldn't, but maybe somebody else could have done a bit earlier. So I stand by my words. I think that their simplified understanding of the realities of the Soviet Union, and their, their understanding of their freedom and how that would affect the Soviet Union well, was erroneous. And of course, freedom as such is great, and I have nothing against freedom. Freedom is wonderful. Well, we're almost out of time. Um, we have one very, very quick question. Sorry. Uh, hi, my name is Peter Fellman, Editor-in-Chief of the Swedish Business Daily. Just what is, in your opinion, the biggest obstacle to find a solution in Ukraine? Mm. In two minutes. And that is international diplomacy at its best. I'll answer even uh, quicker. The biggest obstacle is the wish to put Russia in a place where Western leaders think they want to see Russia. Until that changes, no medicine will be found for this problem. Russia has its own historical understanding, its own historical responsibility for the world or, or one or some of its parts and one all the time Russia will be shown its place all the time Russia will be told please don't hope that you're an equal partner it, it, it just exploded in the Ukraine it just so happened and could have exploded anywhere but there is a lot that stands behind this there's lots of history behind it so the main obstacle is if the West and Russia don't talk don't start talking to each other as equals and start looking for uh, solutions. But if uh, Russia is uh, told, go to that corner, sit there quietly, and we will teach you through our sanctions, nothing will be solved and it will be a bleeding wound for decades. Right. I think we've got literally 30 seconds. Okay, one last question or comment, quickly. 10 seconds. Finally. Uh, <laughs> it wouldn't be complete if I didn't have my opportunity. I Igor, this is my fifth year. Con con um, ten, sec ten seconds. <laughs> $230 million was stolen from the Russian government um, by officials in the Magnitsky case. Magnitsky was murdered. Nobody's ever been charged with a crime. Why? 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 You're, you're okay. fighting for money right. right now. Well, first of all, I'm glad to see you because I don't have the opportunity to see you in the Russian Federation uh, because you are persona non grata. The last year I didn't have time to come to Davos, but I have to go to Russia Outlook. I have to meet uh, Dr. Mr. Browder. I can't g tell you in detail why money was stolen and nobody was charged, but if there are people who are guilty and they were not charged and they were not punished, that is very bad. That's preposterous. He didn't just simply die. He wasn't helped. He wasn't given medical help, etc. People should be charged. Should people should be put behind bars, punished, etc. I don't know why this didn't happen. I'm not dealing with the case. I have no information. But they, but as for who stole what. Now, we have very severe approach in Russia to this, and uh, unlike Mr. Medvedev, Putin is not kind of um, uh, vocal on this um, agenda all the time. Putin acts more than talks, and he acts quite severely against various officials who use, who use various mechanisms to take part in less than legal operations. The time will pass, and I, as far as I understand, the president, he aims long and aims at a long-term target. The system will change, our taxation system is changing, and the matters that Mr. Magnitsky ro raised when he said that the tax inspection, inspection, inspectorate was linked with the gangsters. Now, we have changed that system. We've changed that system, and it's changing very quickly. And I admit I'm very sorry for Magnitsky on a human level. I think it's a mistake that people guilty in the case had not been charged. I can't, I don't even know if anybody has been imprisoned or not. Maybe 
think somebody was charged and punished. I don't know. Nevertheless, I'm glad to we see are you. We sadly out of time. I think we probably could have carried on for another hour at least discussing economics and philosophy and history. Um, but it just remains for me to say thank you. I've learned a lot in this session. Um, it's clear that discussing Russian economy is really about discussing Russian politics and emotion and the soul. And I wish you the best of luck in trying to steer a good course. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.